in there to give the accent. Yes, I'm blind. Half blind or totally blind? Half blind, okay. You'll see why I trust Microsoft in a few minutes. I gotta see the arrow. Good God. Okay, gotta find the damn thing. Let's get the details on this thing and see what I'm doing. The most recent. No. There we go. Can't see it. You just do it by. I'm, I'm going to transfer this thing over. That's what I want to do. So we'll have it on the. There we go. Now, being able to see this thing is going to be a challenge. I appreciate this opportunity to address you folks at the IIIS, and I'll be talking about what to do about peer review. I imagine most, if not all, the people here have been involved in the peer review process, how there was a reviewer having to wrestle with the quality of journal articles. And I wanted to present some of the issues, some of the things that have been going on about it. After this session, there'll be a, an extended workshop, discussion, or however you want to call it, with the idea of maybe looking at some type of an action plan. In 2007, I think it was, I was here attempting to get a knowledge quality uh, standards or specifications organization going with a committee to, for individuals who might review what we should do about peer review. Since that time, some other uh, news has occurred, which I'm going to share with you. And I start off by asking what peer review is. Oh my God. Okay, I'm going to get used to this, this kind of stuff. We're talking about the editors, reviewers, writers, and the readers. All these elements are involved in a peer review process. As I said, I imagine everybody, I would think everybody here has been at least in one of the, in one of the categories most likely all of them. And each person has an ethical duty to monitor what is going on. As a reader, you have a responsibility to judge the quality of what you're reading. If you think there's something funky about what you're reading, you have a responsibility to contact the editor, the, the writer, or somebody. Make your voice known. That's your responsibility as a reader. As an editor, you certainly have the responsibility to screen what you're reviewing properly. And we'll get into that later with some standards. And with the reviewer, sometimes the editor is a reviewer as well. So both of those categories are the same, the editors and the reviewers. The writers obviously have the ethical responsibility of putting together material with integrity. Uh, in April, was it? I can't get my date straight here. It was, let's say it's April. It doesn't make much difference. Yeah, 16 April 2012. I was going through the New York Times and I saw this little item. And Zimmer, basic, Zimmer basically saying, in a nutshell, that peer review is collapsing. <laughs> Come on, let's do this. Okay, that's the article. And just take down 16 April 2012, you can read it as well as I can. And I contacted Zimmer. And I said, well, we're having a conference in July, IIIS, knowledge uh, communication and uh, it's KGCM, I can never get that right, but knowledge generation and communication management. Why don't you come and talk? Why don't you come talk as a keynote speaker and share with us what's been going on? So this is the article that he wrote saying peer review is going to hell in a hack. So what do we think peer review is? Well, first of all, with the upshot of Zimmer, he didn't want to come. 
He said, gee, I don't know much about it. I don't know if I'm competent enough to address your group. I wrote back, I certainly was thinking this, I think I wrote this investment some time, months ago. I said, well, good God, you wrote an article about it. You must know something about it. And you're not competent to speak on the subject? Maybe I should tell your editor. I didn't say that to him. I said, well, if you're not competent to write about it or talk about it, maybe he's, he might have stage fright. So give the guy, give, give the devil his due. At least he did a service in writing the article. So that kind of helps generate sessions like this. There's more than Zimmer, of course, but he certainly brought it to the public's attention. And I'll bring it to, to your attention further by an article that appeared in Science just last week. I came up from Mexico, and I get the hard copy of this. I didn't have a chance to look at the electronic copy. And right in the edition of Science, we see a reference to fraud detection tool could shake up psychology. It turns out it's, it, that's most of the stuff uh, that is submitted in the psychological world is junk. And this fraud detection tool, and there's a lot of controversy about it, is, is detecting a lot of this data manipulation, just bad research and everything else. I won't go into all the details, but that's just another incident of this thing. This, uh, this is in the 6th July edition of uh, this year of science, and it is uh, just the, the, the title of the article I just read. Monovision's great. When you try to read something, it's really good. So, so bear with me for a second if I can see the title. Yeah, so fraud detection tool could shake up psychology. That's on page 21. There's just another instance. This is an ongoing problem. This is nothing that Carl Zimmer made up, and it's something that simply existed a few years ago. It's ongoing. And this article basically says that the psychological world is really shaken up. In other words, most of what's being produced in that discipline is garbage. So what do we think peer review is? We think that there's an ethical environment. When we review an article, we think ourselves as being ethical. We know what we're doing. We're going to be telling the truth and all this other stuff. We're going to recognize uh, fraud when we see it and do something about it and not let it through. We have standards of quality. We know that what is a good article, what isn't, or presentation. Uh, we have quality reviewers. We kind of assume that in the peer review process when we pick up an article in science that these things have been screened. Where's my edition? I can't see it. So we pick something like that up. We assume the articles have been screened and they have quality and so forth. We rely on the article for our research. If the article has is something wrong with the article, that percolates through everything that follows. So the fraud in one article can contaminate everything that follows it. That's a real problem. And a lot of papers have been retracted on that basis. Well, I did my research and I relied on this, this, and this, and this. Well, it turns out that this, this, and this, and this doesn't have any integrity. So, oh my God, so what kind of conclusions have I drawn? So that has to be withdrawn. So it, 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 there's a chain reaction to this stuff when you have bad peer review. We also think that there is a contribute, contribution to the body of knowledge. So you have to, have, to, have, to have, have to ask the question, well, what is it that we're producing? What is it? What kind of knowledge is it? What is knowledge anyway? I, when I was going through graduate school years ago, I got caught up in this argument with the chair people, uh, the chairperson of the department and my committee and everybody else. I go to all these journals. Back then there were a bunch of them, and now it's just ridiculous. Anybody can write anything and publish it anywhere in a, quote, peer-reviewed environment. And I keep asking, I see all these journals and all this nitpicking. I remember a guy named Dalton. He was a professor there. And you go by him, and you look in his room. He had this little, little glass window you look through. And there was Dalton bent over a table, just like this. Just, just like this, just kind of looking, reading this stuff, all these journal articles with such intensity. What are you doing, Pete? God, God, it's so important. I'm really into this stuff. Do you know there are about 500,000 other journals out there with the same crap in them? And whoever reads this stuff, and most of these dissertations sit on the shelf anyway. What have you done? What kind of knowledge is that? What have you contributed? So, I don't know. I just got really jaundiced, I guess, by seeing that. And I said, well, what, what am I producing? How am I going to contribute to the body of knowledge? Well, I realized at that point that a dissertation does not contribute to the body of knowledge, really. All it is is a demonstration of what you can do, what kind of research you can do. 
I can, I can make knowledge, and I can, I can create knowledge. You know, I could create courses on vacuum cleaners. I could create a whole degree program on vacuum cleaners. I can have a history, a technology, blah, 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 blah. You could figure it out. And I can have a whole degree called vacuum cleaner degree. That's, is that contributing to the body of knowledge? But that's what these journals are about, a lot of them. Who reads this crap? So, I, so he asked him, what is peer review? I'm not sure what it is. All it is is that I know that I'm supposed to be on your equal in some way, and I'm supposed to be look at what you do and say that there's quality to it. What really is it? This is what we're finding. You, 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 you've been there. You've done that. Destructive competition. You have to publish or perish. You tear somebody's eyes out. You make sure they don't publish your article. You do everything you can to bring them down. Then we get the other stuff, fraud, data, I mean, the, whole, the whole nine yards. There are no uniform standards. That's why I wanted to set the knowledge, quality, and specifications organization up. So we had some idea that I pick this up or pick that up and say, okay, I've got a checklist. This has been done, that's been done, that's been done, that's been done, that's been done. Then I pick up something like that and say, okay, all these things have been done. I'm not going to guarantee that there's quality in that article, but at least I have some floor that I know this has been done. But I pick up an article. I read that and said, God, I don't know. I remember picking up, uh, I, I picked up stuff and I looked at it, and I'm not sure of what I'm reading. I, all I can do is give it a critical thinking point of view. I say, well, that kind of holds together. The sentence structure's there and stuff like that. Does it really contribute to the body of knowledge? I don't know. I remember picking up a paper for this conference, a guy named uh, Vladimir Lefebvre. And I didn't know who the, I, I saw this thing it had to do with bipolarity and enteral field. Good God, what is this? I said, this has got to be really specialized. Who wrote this thing? I was going through this thing. I was picking through it. I could pick, I could kind of figure out what the hell I was doing. I looked it up. I looked them up. And I, and I, I must confess, I cheated on this. I looked up on the internet. Who the hell's going to talk about bipolarity and enteral field? It was Vladimir Lefebvre. Who's Vladimir Lefebvre? He was the chief policy analyst for the Soviet Union. Jesus Christ, what the hell is this? I said, you know, I, you get the, you, you, this is what happens in peer review. You kind of can figure it out. You get on, now especially, you get on the internet, you can figure out who wrote these things. In fact, I sent one back to you. There was one that had to do that was already, not already published. This guy is a major, super major professor somewhere in Africa. He published, I don't know what the hell it was. I sent it back. I said, good God, I can't review this. And then I saw Lefebvre. I said, Jesus, I can understand it. I think it's okay. And it turns out that Lefebvre was a mutual friend of uh, a guy named Coombs. He's a psychology professor at uh, Rutgers. Uh, and I, he and I looked at it. He knows, he hired Lefebvre at uh, uh, New Mexico State. And I said, good God, do I let this paper in or not? Yeah, we got to let it in. He's the chief policy analyst. So, so what's the content? I kind of understand it. Do I know what's good? In, I don't know. So you take somebody major like that, let him in. Let's find out what the hell he's got to say. So I'm a peer reviewer reading this thing. I don't know what to do. But yeah, yeah I, I, I've taken enough political science and international affairs. Yeah, you better let him in. Let's find out what he's got to say. He never, I don't think he showed up. He was over at the AAAS uh, meeting a few years ago in 2010. He didn't show up there either. Well, that's curious. I, I, I could never figure that out. I still have the paper, and it's, it's weird. What is peer review? What do they say about it? I'm not the only one chattering about this. It's uh, Horton, editor of the British Medical Journal, saying basically it's garbage. Come on. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whoa, Jesus, goddamn Microsoft. I got some. I got some words for that. I will not repeat them. It goes up here. No, that's not the way. It helps to be blind. It helps to be blind. Now I'm supposed to go full. That one. Now let's just go to the next one. Thank you. Only eight percent of the. This is Najib quote. So I, I, the, this other guy uh, Horton saying the same thing. It's garbage. Nobody has any, any, uh, so it's based on faith. You might as well believe in the green donkey on the other side of the moon. Who can prove it? You got to be there. As soon as you get to the other side of the moon, guess what? The donkey's gone. It's over Saturn. Get over there. 
No, he's moving to Jupiter. So how are you going to prove it? It's all faith. I have a faith that there's a green donkey over there. <laughs> and I do pray to that donkey at night. Now, where's peer review? I, I, I'm, you know, I'm getting, I want to get down to the bottom. You, this, 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 the peer review problem is superficial. There's something else going on underneath. And I'm seeing all kinds of examples of this. Who looks at what the other's doing? I'm talking about faulty software. My bread and butter for a number of years was also documentation. I've been in a number of inst installations doing this stuff. Do my philosophy over here. And do, I mean, who hires philosophers anymore? So I've got to do something to pay the bills. So I do this other stuff. That's a confession. Poor documentation. Defective products. Bad engineering. Some examples. There, there was a... Uh, book put out in the 70s called Design for a New World. Most designs, not the most, a lot of them are garbage. I'll give you some quick examples, even in this hotel. I was ironing the shirt last night. I did a great job, right? The ironing board was right in the closet, blah, blah, pull the iron out, iron the whole bit. Where's the plug? The plug's way the hell over in the bedroom somewhere. So you think of it, I, I don't know, I, I jury rig something and I, and I iron the shirt, right? Okay. There, uh, there are all kinds of design things like that you see. Things that are ergonom not ergonomically put together very well. So you get bad design. Business scandals. And all you need to do, this thing's not connected to the internet, but if it were made it is, I could open up and it's gonna be here all week talking about all the business scandals. And I think you know you can name just as many as I can, if not more. Politics, we know what that's all about. I won't go there. Sales. Sales is nothing but lying. The whole legal system. That's a damn lie, too. I mean, very cynical, these I really am. But th th you know that. I don't think I need to convince anybody. Advertising. We are living in this kind of a society. I worked for Microsoft for a while, one of my little stints. I don't like Microsoft. I, I'm forced to use it. This, before I left, this is what I screen captured. I was doing the NT documentation. It was for the Windows NT. I was doing documentation, writing the knowledge base articles. We got boilerplate. One of the pieces of the boilerplate, at least they were honest enough to admit it, all this crap that you're shoving out as fixes is not regression tested. So you could be installing a virus on your system. This was the screen capture of something called the RAID database. Just before it closed out, there were how many errors in this thing? Let's see. Uh, 400 and, yeah, 455,000, yeah, 455,504 errors. I mean, these are, these are trouble tickets. Open trouble tickets for Windows NT, Service Pack 6A. When I went over to Windows, two th uh, yeah, Windows 2000, when I left in February of 2000, there were 65,000 bugs. There's no way in holy hell you're going to resolve all that. This is Microsoft. It hasn't changed. Sands, Sands Institute, the organization, talks about Microsoft in words I cannot use here. Well, I mean, they don't, they're not publicly. But you talk to some of the editors, and that's basically what they say. That's a little negative advertising. But I am telling the truth. Here's an interesting thing. I, that's, I can't, I don't know when the hell why that thing, it, it's covering up the source, that's all right, but I, I'll give you the source if you're really interested. I see this figure all over the internet. I talk about source integrity. There's another example of faulty whatever. You see this figure all over the internet, 90%. I've heard, I think, a lot of people. Can somebody give me what the source of that is? That's just one example, the, the, uh, the link that I gave. I have not been able to find exactly where this figure came from. <laughs> everybody quotes everybody else. <laughs> I don't know where, I guess, all I know is I walk into every installation, I see Microsoft, much my dismay. I like Linux. Thank you. Let the cat out of the bag. Other areas. These are just two examples. I don't need to perseverate on this. Uh, the lying. I'm, I'm leading up to something here. We're living in a culture here where this is not only permitted, I think it's encouraged. I'll get to why I think so in a minute. What are the sources of the problems? We've got dishonesty, the lack of knowledge, ideology. Why, why, why all this misinformation? Dishonesty, I'll get to in a second. Lack of knowledge, 
You gotta look at the schools. The lack of motivation to learn. Wishful thinking. I look at uh, William James and people like that. They talk about the will to believe. You really want to believe something to be true. So you turn it into truth. So you want the conclusion to be blah, 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 and you go out and look out for the, look for the literature and the research that confirms what you want to see. A lot of things are written like that, and a lot of it's subconscious. Peer, pr peer pressure. You better find that that is the case. I think the most famous example of peer pressure, one of them is Lysenko. You better believe Lysenko and all the things you write about uh, characteristics being passed on because you're raised as a communist, your kids are going to be communists. You better believe that. You better write articles that support that, or else there's a gulag waiting for you. So there's a lot of peer pressure. That's kind of a uh, more obvious example. Ego. Just plain the ego. I just want to inflate myself. Sloppy methods. Sloppy methods get back to the knowledge quality specifications organization. I think if we had some specifications of what good knowledge is, we might avoid some of these. I don't know. We'll work on that in the workshop. Sources of it. I'm going to get into this genetic thing in a second. Ego, peer pressure, lots of sense of virtue. The sense of, uh, in the Greek societies, we had the idea of virtue. The person does the best that they're capable of doing. We've lost that. We are shoved into college. People are shoved into colleges, and a lot of people have no business being there. They're told to go to college. They're told to get the degree. There's a pressure. Get it. And you go through, and you're kind of in the situation, maybe toward college. You might get a degree, maybe. You really shouldn't have gotten it, but you're forced to do it. And you really don't want to do that. And there's more of the pressure in the society to perform. Now, I'm wondering if it occurred to me writing this. We talk about dishonesty and the projection of truth, talking about truth. Go into the species and the species themselves. Now take the example of the peacock. Take the feathers off the peacock, what does it look like? Take the color away from the peacock. You don't have much. You inflate yourselves. So it's not only in our activities and writing articles that are really kind of inflate the truth, advertising, sales, all the stuff. It may be inherited. It may be in a species itself. The species itself is designed to project things that are not really there. Cat fluffing up its fur. So the cat does this. And in the normal state, the cat's an ordinary cat. The whole sp the species seems to do that. It projects things that are not really itself. Do not appear with the camouflage, everything. These are all built into the species, animal species. And I think humans probably have this as well. It's, an, it's genetic. I'm just asking, I'm not sure if it's, but I just wonder if it's not a genetic characteristic. So when you publish an article, you say, okay, I'm gonna publish something, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna inflate the ego, I'm gonna kind of project things that are not really there. I'm just raising the question. I'm not giving, and not saying that's the answer, but I'm raising that as an issue. What is the art? We want to correct peer review. We want to be honest and everything else. I'm just bringing this aspect into it. It may not be the world you think it is. You even have the, in politics, the emperor's new clothes. I think we're kind of coming to the society, it's always been there. But I'm wondering, especially in this age of competition and so forth, we've kind of cloaked ourselves in all this. Take off the clothes, and we don't really have much. Same thing with the Wizard of Oz. I think I'm just wondering. I'm just raising these issues. We then ask also, who are the experts? Am I an expert in anything? I don't know. Just because when I, I come to think this is the case, I really know all about this stuff, but then it's all, it's all destroyed. I don't know who the expert is anymore. I don't know what an expert is. We all, it's, I think everybody has something to contribute, perhaps. So we look at peer review, and we look at the review of an article as, I'm an expert reviewing this, like the, the favor. What the hell am I reading here? I don't know. Maybe the guy's got a point. There's something I, I, I'm missing here. 
So I don't know who the expert is. I don't know how to correct that. I mean, you, you got the degree. What does the, what does the degree show? Are you an expert in that field? I might have gotten really cynical with this. Then you have this problem of the actual line. You have a white line. How you, it would, you told not to lie. If somebody's dying of cancer and they don't know they're dying of cancer, what do you tell them? You tell them the white line, you're going to be okay? Or tell them the truth and let them suffer with the truth? I mean, you don't know. This, these are the, some of the complicated issues, the ethics of that. Were you presenting an article like, hey, I, let, I read Lefebvre. Do I understand what the hell I'm reading? I don't know. I wish the hell he were here. It would have been great if he were here. I asked then. I, I might have gotten really cynical. I was kind of in a depressed mood when I wrote this, admittedly. I am telling the truth there. So are we a society based on lies? Or is it, is it because it's, we're genetic? Are they lies? And I think this, and as a philosopher, I'll say this. What is a lie? I say it's a lie. Lie has to do with the intent. If it, and this gets into, I'm going to get some, some other issues here in a second. Lie is the intent, the deceiving, to not to tell the truth. I would say advertisers and lawyers are liars. They know damn well what the truth is, but I want to present it in such a way that it's not really the truth. Of course, what is the truth? There's another issue there, too. But it's the intent. What the truth is or isn't, whether you know it or not, it's your intent to see. I'm going to say something that is not right. I know damn well it's not. You know what it is over here. Well, regardless of what it is, good, bad, or different, you're trying to tell them something different. Your intent. That is what distinguishes a lie from anything else. I think, again, again what is the origin of is the ego problem. Me, me, me. It is a me culture. As evidenced by this book, Christopher Latt. This has been out for about 30 years, 30, 40 years. I think we have to consider that. It's the me culture, covering up the ego. So when I write an article, present it, and so forth, that's not only me, but think of how great I am, and so forth. So you present this thing thinking you're going to get the Nobel Prize. Oh, come on. I think this extends all, in other words, I'm saying is I think this may extend all across the spectrum that this problem of this whole idea of integrity of knowledge, peer review, and so forth extends to everybody. There's another thing about the origin of the problem having to do with this ignorance. If you think the peer reviewers are having problems discerning quality, what about the population? And this is the kind of stuff you run into. I'm arguing that the problem we can talk about peer review is being superficial. It's, a, it's, it's the tip of the iceberg. And the problem percolates all the way down to the very bottom in the society. Yeah, I'm getting to the school system. Look at that figure. And you look at this figure. 30% of the population don't know whether the sun goes around the earth or the earth goes around the sun. That's pretty... I, 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 there's the data, the sources there, another one. The, the National Science Foundation and uh, America's report card give similar figures. You can, you can Google it just as well as I can. The same kinds of figures popped up, pop up. Uh, that the uh, center of the Earth is very hot, 20% of the people don't think so. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, the ordinary tomatoes do not have genes, but genetically modified tomatoes do. Now, let's say that this were a real uh, democracy. So we're going to vote on it. <laughs> we're going to go out and vote. You're always going to find the unknown. So I don't know. So you have maybe 3%. So this would win. This is the thing about peer review, in a way. If you're going to have the majority ruling that something is acceptable. I'm not saying the peer review is of this bad. <laughs> but it makes you wonder. The quality of knowledge. I mean, it disagrees that uh, disagrees that astrology is not all that scientific. I'm no, I know. In fact, one of my ex students, four row average, brilliant. He thinks there's he thinks there's something to astrology. Uh, there is uh, thinks antibiotics will kill viruses as well as bacteria. I know in Mexico, you walk into the 
pharmacy, you can buy antibiotics right across the counter. And, you ha and it's true in other countries, evidently. And I, there's an issue with that. And you say, okay, I'm going to buy an antibiotic. And of course, we know what antimicrobial resistance is. So everybody says, I'm going to take an antibiotic. So everybody gets antimicrobial resistant. That's an interesting situation. I mean, 45% of the population can't distinguish. This is in this country. This is an interesting little quote about the school system. Notice I say school system and not educational system. I can harp on the school system all day. We can all do that. There's an issue. I think there's an issue there. I really do. There's something called uh, A Nation at Risk that was published in 1983 by Carnegie Mellon University. Some people, you seem to be familiar. And you look at the America's Report Card, nothing has changed. It was so bad back then, and it's worse now, that it was considered a national security issue. We have another issue with a peer review. I call it the borderlands of science. I introduced this into my logic classes. This is tricky. And I've known some of these cases personally. Norm Shealy is one. I'll give you a quick example. These are some of the names. Shockley and his racism. Pauling with his vitamin C. That nonsense. We have the Rhine Institute at, out of Duke University. We look at Rhine's research, and it's just so flawed, methodologically f flawed. Stanley McDonald, I'm going to get to some of these cases. And this is really tricky. I don't know how you deal with it. I, I think I know how you deal with it, but God. Uh, Heisch. Bernard Heisch is astrophysics. He's, he raises the issue about the UFOs. I think he's got some legitimate points. I, I happen to agree with Heisch, actually. And I think there's some very serious issues having to do with what these things are and so forth. But he's not, he's not going to go out and say, yeah, they're flying all around and I've been abducted. But he gets out in there. And I call it the borderlands. And you kind of have to go to the borderlands many times for discovery. Uh, Josephson. I've met Joseph. And he, Josephson. He was at the Consciousness Conference several times. He talked about the, uh, the musicology and quantum mechanics and stuff like this. I don't know what the hell it was. You look, read the stuff, and I don't know. And you kind of go out to these areas like Eastern mysticism and so forth, David Bohm and so forth, and you kind of have to go out there because we do get into the box. How far do you go? <coughs> now, here's something. Here is a case. And I, I'm bothered by this. I really, I saw this the other day. I was on YouTube. I, I, I watch a lot of YouTube, a lot of documentaries. I'm bothered by this a lot. I know Richard Paul out in California and Sonoma and his Critical Thinking Institute. You go in it's called criticalthinking.org. Go in there. It's a good site. A lot of, a lot of information for, for students. Everybody's into it. I'm bothered by this. Stan, Stan McDaniel is one of the directors. He's a principal in the organization. And this is, these are his credentials. Jesus, I wish I had credentials like this. Here's what McDaniel's into. I'm bothered by this. Are you familiar with the pictures on Mars? Where back in 73, they went up to the explorer, one of those things, and they saw this face. And the face was evidence of aliens or some goddamn stuff like this. And, and I, you hear McDaniel go on his McDaniel report. I think the buggers lost it. He gets in there, and these are evidence. There's a conspiracy uh, in NASA to keep all the stuff on the people. This guy has lost his screws. And this guy's still with a critical thinking organization. Look at his credentials. These are the photographs. They went up there and they set up another explorer or whatever the hell it was, and they found a look at this. what they are. These are ordinary rock formations. No, McDaniel, these are aliens. And the U.S. government is conspiratorial, and they're keeping that from you folks. There are Martians. That space, that's a Martian. What the hell it is? I don't know what it is. Go in there and look at it. It's bizarre. Sheely. I know this guy. <coughs> Not Missouri, someplace like that. Had a good friend of mine, Bob Waters. He was 
he was into all kinds of stuff, and he knew some people down at the astrophysics lab in Tucson. I met Sheely, or you got to know him through a friend of mine at Duke, and blah, 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 blah. He sent me this thing called the, it was a gigatent. The idea was for electrical stimulation, and you put two electrodes on here, it's supposed to do all, I won't go into all the details. And this is supposed to be, it's supposed to do everything. Maybe, maybe make you see Jesus or whatever it's supposed to do. I don't know. This was, this was the device. He sent one out to me. Bob and I, we took it down to the, I guess it was astrophysics last lab in Tucson. He knew somebody down there and put it on a spectral am analyzer. And it's supposed to produce gigahertz frequencies. We, oh, I opened it up. Well, there's a circuit diagram. I started looking at this thing, and he and I started looking at it. And I don't know, we had, a, we had a few. We started laughing hysterically. I just laughed my ass off for about two hours. But I thought, started thinking about this. I said, wait a minute. Look at the circuit diagram. You go into the big, big IC book and look in the big IC book, and all it is is a cheap 800 megahertz oscillator that spikes at a gigahertz once in a while. It's a gigatons. This is a PhD MD. Holo since the two. You look at his publications. He's got about two or 300 of them. And good journals, too. Medical doctor. This guy's no idiot. And you just look at this thing. What the hell is this? We looked at this thing. We, sent, and, and, and we bought, got the spectral results back, and that's all it did. That just as the IC book said, it spikes at a gigahertz once in a while. And it's supposed to do what wonders, and I don't know what. Maybe it does. I don't know. But, but there it is. It, it does, of course. It doesn't do a damn thing. He had this thing advertised on his website. It's not there anymore. It's something called something else, Megatens or something. I don't know what the hell it is. I saw this. I couldn't believe it. Well, I raised this issue in my one of my philosophy science classes. And I, the one it was a nurse who picked this out. And this is what I'm getting at the point of the points I'm going to make here. Here we have a guy who's sterling in his qualifications and his publications up to a point. She noticed something. There was a break in 2000. All the publications up to about year 2000, yeah, no problem. And depression and I don't know what else. There was a qualitative change in the papers from 2000 to 2002, 2001. All of a sudden, the papers changed character. They really got into the depression. Now, what is this? She came up with a conclusion, and I agree with her. This guy had a psychotic break. Something happened. He was sane up to a point, and bang, he hit the floor like a drunk does. And we kind of, I thought, wait a minute, what are the implications of this? I'm going through, and I see Sheely, and I see all the stuff he's written, and stuff like this, and I'm going to say, I'm going to use Sheely as a reference. Look at his qualifications. Yeah, I'm going to use Sheely. It's like using Josephson or somebody else. If the guy has a psychotic break, though, look what he did. The character has changed. So he had to be, everything you quote, everything you use has to be in context. You simply can't rely upon the individual. What are the signs of the crossing of the boundary? How do you recognize? This gets into, starts getting into the knowledge quality stuff. Faulty methods, will to believe, abandonment for, abandonment for the dispassionate research for the truth, whatever the truth is. At least you have some idea that you're looking for something. No qualifying conclusions, all, the other, all this other stuff. Is there a psychotic break? You're going to look for stuff like this. Is there a change in the person's publications? What happened with this McDaniel? I don't know. If he's publishing, here's the problem. If he's publishing, with, publish, still publishing in reputable journals, what about the reviewers? You've got to look twice. You've got to look twice. How much of this stuff that's published or gets out there is really being reviewed? You see McDaniel coming through, see Joseph and somebody else, yeah, we we'll accept it. Like, like my, in my experience, with well, Lefebvre, I'd be quite honest. You're going to say, no, I'm not going to accept a paper from the chief policy analyst of the Soviet Union? Who in the hell am I? This is a problem. So I've experienced it. I've been there, done that. I'm glad I accepted the paper, and I would have accepted the paper still. But that's the, one of the problems. What do you do with people like this? I don't know. Then all that aside, we got basically, it's part of our culture. Most people do lie. They just consciously say, I'm not going to tell the truth. Resume 
there's another one. I'm saying, how deep does this problem go? So it's not simply looking at an article. I'm talking about the context, what gives rise to all this. Let's just, I just go through the news, about the number of people who've got bad resumes. I'm not going to just perseverate on this. It's out there. You can Google it as well as I am. I'm not going to perseverate. Right. Inflating test scores, that kind of stuff. I just took these, sam these random samples off of Google. There they are. I didn't look at all these. Uh, here's a good one. I'm a writer. At least I think I am. At least I've gotten paid for it. A couple of years ago, I was down after I got on Social Security and everything, how in the hell am I going to supplement the income? I get on these writing sites and Elance and places like that. And a lot of reputable people writing for these things. So I'm not the only PhD. And I get on this thing and I started getting into some of these sites. I started seeing this stuff. I said, well, I've known people, I've known students plagiarize papers and stuff like this. But you've got whole services. It's a real industry. About, I, I've heard figures about six or seven hundred of these things out there, of these organizations, these, these companies that will actually get a bevy of writers, PhDs preferably, who will write papers that are not, they're not plagiarized, ironically enough. They sell them, they write for money, sell them to term paper, ink, whatever the hell they call themselves. Uh, students buy them. Hundreds of these out there. I've contacted the professors. If you're, t if you're still teaching, I warn you, you're going to get crap like this. You're going to get students who go out to these so-called services, and here's some of them. I, I could do this all the day. There are, there are gonna be, you're going to have a number of students out there who will actually buy term papers that you'll, the uh, copyscape and the Turnitin will not pick up because those have been checked by those these organizations are pretty slick. They have those papers checked. So they turn them into you. You're not going to run them, be able to run them through CopyScape. My advice, if you, anybody who has students write papers, my advice is this. There's one damn surefire way you can slow this down. It's horrible. It's a pain in the ass, but I do it. Somebody passes a term paper into me. Guess what I do? I look at them, and it, it, it takes time if you're going to go this route. You quiz them on the paper. You take one or two or three points. Well, what did you say here? La, 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 la. If they give you this dumb look, you've got them. Ask them to elaborate on it. What do you think about this? Or expand on this. Take two or three of them. Do them a, a kind of a mini oral. Just a thumb in the wind type of thumb in the wind check. That's how you stop some of this crap. Because chances are they're going to buy this damn thing and pass it in to you. And chances are if they're stupid enough to do that, they're probably going to be stupid enough not to know the contents. Try that one. Or it's a pain in the ass. It really is. It takes time. But that's where you can stop this, slow this stuff down. Give them a quick oral. Two or three questions out of that. Bang. You got them. Now, term papers are bad enough. Yeah, pay, there was some more. Essays, yeah, that kind of stuff. And there are a bunch of them out there. There's some articles about these. Now, all right, now, this gets even better. Term papers are bad enough. Guess what? Dissertations. We go to the big. We go to the big league. There are people out there. Oh, I, I, I run. I couldn't believe this. I said, <laughs> "Damn it!" I, I grew up when you're not. You're not supposed to do this, folks. There are people out there who buy their dissertations. You get a dissertation. If you're on a committee, dissertation committee, you better prepare a good oral. Chances are they'll know the contents, but you better go drill further. The PhDs have gotten so bad, they, years ago, they started this thing called a chancellor degree. I, I, I try to research it now. That kind of went, Cornell tried to start this thing because they said the PhD qualities plummeted so badly. You have to have another one above that, a research degree that's kind of like a meta PhD. It's gotten that bad. I'll go one better. We've gone through the essays, gone through the term papers, gone through the PhD dis the dissertations. Guess what? You know you could pay people to take your goddamn degree? I calculated this out. I think I calculated something like $30,000. I calculated all this stuff. You get 30,000 smackers, and you have somebody come in, and they'll be your surrogate, and you walk them through from day one, register the whole nine years, photo ID, the whole nine years, bang. You pay them 30,000 bucks, bang, the exit, and you, you pick it up at the end. It's like surrogate babies. Surrogate mothers. You got surrogate PhD. 
So we put something like that in front of a nuclear reactor when you have a meltdown. I love that world. There's a spam. I, I couldn't help doing this. You could buy the degree. There are many ways, there are many rights you can take. So they get on a peer review committee. One suggestion I might have, we do it like the cat card. We had a white sands. Had a little gold seal, and there you've got most a lot of people have been there and done that. Shove it into a card reader, the thumbprint, iris scan, the whole bit. Put, put that on a degree or a transcript. I don't know. I, I just, it's, what do you do with this? How far do you go? See, what, it's one thing. It's like everything else. You have, a, you have somebody does something like this. You have a countermeasure, and it's like counterintelligence. Bang, somebody else is a, a leapfrog ahead of you. You keep doing that, and you keep doing that. How far have we gone? Part of the problem is, in, is information te integrity. People don't know what the information is. They get frustrated, the competition, they, they go buy degrees just to avoid the problem. People don't know what good quality is. It's like the example with the, with the, uh, the Microsoft example, 90%. Where would you get that figure? They pulled it out of here, if you get my drift. This is what I recommend. You require it, a real curriculum. Philosophy built it at every freaking level. You get tired of this stuff. You get tired of seeing sex, business, and sports on TV all the time. How about a little bit of this? Put your iPad down for about 30 nanoseconds and do some thinking. Require it. What's wrong with that? Do you know you go to Mexico and you see in their curriculum, it's requirement. Logic is a requirement of all the secondary students. Philosophy is. They require that. You don't weasel out of that. So you, I can walk in and talk to, I can talk about modus ponens, disjunctive syllogism, to a high school student. I can call ethica. Ethica is part of the materials program in the universities. Everybody gets it. Even the trade schools get it. Not only the scientific method, but the ethics that go with it. And they have social service coupled with that. You go out there and perform a service in your community, and they monitor that. That's Mexico. If they can do it, why in the hell can't we? So, I, yeah, I respect that system a lot better. I got a little prejudice here, I'll have to confess. So, where are we? Alaric came into Rome at 410. There was nothing there. He sacked it. He, I mean, he pulled the gold out of the city. He didn't even take the city. Nothing was not worth it. I kind of get that feeling. Again, I was kind of depressed when I wrote this. I'd, I'll be confessed. <laughs> There's nothing left to sack. Just seal the goal. I kind of get that feeling with some of the other countries we're dealing with. They're coming to see the United States, and they're sucking every bit of it out they can. They're going to leave a shell, a husk. I ask this. I kind of see the scenario. If things have collapsed at that point, and we're producing quality here and there, there are centers of excellence. We are doing good things. We can't even get a person up to the space station anymore, though, can we? I, we kind of, we don't have, I I'm, lived in the peak in the 60s and 70s. We had that spirit of exploration and so forth, where there was a hope and everything else. Now we can't even get anything up to the space station, so we've got to rely on the Russians. Now we're privatizing it. But are those centers of excellence? And I'm wondering, so I see a scenario perhaps then will become like the medieval period where we had these centers of excellence. We won't have anything in between. It'd be kind of like uh, the life of Brian, Monty Python. And so the first scene is the king walks in. I mean, rides on a white horse, as I recall. Here comes the king. How do you know he's a king? He's the only one not covered in shit. <laughs> That's how you know. So you have these moats. You go to the point of the moat. You see, you see the little island there of excellence. And everybody else, the masses are out there, all led by the nose. So I, mean, I, I know I'm a cynic. I called a cynic when I was 17 years old, working for a newspaper. God, you're cynical. No, I think I'm a realist. I think we have to do one basic thing. We have to go back to some basics, to the Greeks. What are our values? That gets into virtue. We've lost that. 
to try to be the, like the Cheshire Cat or something else, or the peacock or the whatever. What are our basic values as human beings? That's why I get back to the philosophy. Who are we? What are we about? People don't want to talk about that. Maybe this, maybe Freud is right. Maybe it is a death instinct. I don't know. But that's, I think, where you have to start. That, that it, it, once you, there's that bedrock. I don't think we've got a bedrock anymore. When Allard walked into Rome, there's nothing there to take. I had, I was teaching a capstone seminar in government administration, public administration years ago, taught a semester. Every political science course, everything having to do with political anything, they read Plato and Aristotle. Plato's Republic and Aristotle's Republic. You don't walk out that door with anything until you read those and know them. I don't care, I don't care about anything else. Plato and Aristotle, that's it. And political, political philosophy, that's what you've got to know. And you better know it well if you're going to get anything in my course. It's all been said. A few, it's a few embellishments after that, but that's what it is. You know what the reaction was when I got the student comments back from my evaluation? Burn Plato and Aristotle. Three or four of them, they wrote the word similar to that. Burn them. No, you know, I put philosophy at every level. You do it like Mexico. I like that system. I really do. I think we've got to also get some instrumentation. Crap detector. I think it was Toulmin's idea in the critical thinking conference back in 88 that I did, did some presentation at. And he has in his logic book something called a crap detector. He actually built one. He had a light on it. He had this thing that go around. That's where that comes from. I, I know where that, I know who did that, but you go around and somebody, some student would start talking some baloney and boy, the light would go on. You press a little button back here. Boop! Not you, Chris. I can do it to you too, or you. <laughs> I think we're all full of it. A beep! Microsoft. You know. Basic standards. You don't even teach them in the schools very much, I don't think. Not what you see on the internet. This is a basic, this is a kind of the basis of a knowledge quality specifications approach. You've got to know this kind of stuff. Do you ask those questions every time you pick up uh, uh, something to review or read or evaluate? That's basic. I learned that in high school. I remember Irene Dwelly. She beat it into our damn heads. So you go on Google and see all this crap. That crap detector burns out. After, that's only, after about five minutes, I had to put another battery in it. <laughs> Another thing, you bring that into the schools, epistemology. There's a difference between information and knowledge. There's a lot of information. It's all over the web. You've got data turned into information, something that's kind of intelligible. And then, but well, that is the difference between that and knowledge. What is knowledge? I hear these people, I believe. I asked people, where are the donuts? <laughs> I believe they're on aisle set. You know, I don't give a goddamn what you believe in. I believe in the green donkey. What's that? He's on the other side of the moon. So we're getting this little dialogue. I believe. I believe. I don't care what you believe. What do you know? Do you know that those donuts are on aisle, whatever the hell it was? I, I don't care what you believe. So I had this little dialogue. Finally, after about five minutes, I'm able to get down to them. How do you know? First of all, you know that they're on whatever. Yeah, I know. How do you know it? Because I've done this, that, and that. I've been there, history, hist uh, history, logic, whatever it may, scientific method, whatever. People don't know the difference between both. Try this again. Try this. When you hear somebody tell you, I believe this, go through that little exercise. I believe. First of all, do you really believe it or do you know it? How do you account for what you're saying? That is epistemology, then that turns into knowledge. Then there's a quality of that knowledge. I may be able to think I account for that knowledge, but then what's the quality of that? And then you get back to the previous slide. But people, it's amazing. I think in this culture, I live in this culture, I can talk about other cultures, but I say this culture, and you hear that all the time. And I'm wondering if that's part and partial, partial one of the reasons why we see this degeneracy. 
people believe things. 46% of the people believe that humans exist in their present form, came into the present form 10,000 years ago. I believe it. Okay. F, walk out and come into the philosophy class. I think another thing is not only this methodology, you've got to have the will to do something to change. Got to, first of all, you've got to recognize there's a problem. And sometimes you're, we're living in a kind of a greenhouse. You don't know there's a problem until it hits. You start seeing some of the manifestations, like Zimmer's article. We can't get a person up to the space station and these little things that start creeping in. You see the corruption and see everything else. These are just signs. Again, I'm get, trying to get down to the core. You have to have the will to do something. Not only that, you have to have a plan and the means to carry it out. You want change in this country? You've got to do these things. You don't simply get out in the middle of the street up in New York City and beat on a bunch of damn bongos around. Blah, 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 I hate Wall Street. I don't like Wall Street either, but you've got to approach it in a good way. I say good way, a, this kind of way. Not, this is not the only thing you do. I'm not saying this is absolute. But these are the kinds of things I think you have to involve in your approach to solving problems. You have to have the knowledge of the standards, some of the stuff I referred to before. Ethics. Just because you're the most brilliant individual in the world doesn't mean that you have ethics. I point to Stalin and the Nazi hierarchy for that. There's a good book you, I think you might want to look at, The Nazi Doctors by uh, Robert J. Lipton. How can the professional class be dragged into the Holocaust? Very brilliant individuals. How do you get sucked into something like that? Gradualism, the desensitization are two words. But there's ethics, which you again have to know your own values. Get to some very fundamental things called philosophy. I'm one of those, I have to confess. Screening the reviewers and so forth, that's the last thing. There's a component of this conference, or there has been, knowledge generation communication management. I like that expression because it incorporates it at all. You generate the knowledge. How do you generate it? Through an epistemology. You take information, transform it into knowledge via quality, the standards and so forth, the epistemologies and so forth. How do you manage it? How do you disperse it? So you get, you take what you have as knowledge, you turn in on information, turn it into knowledge, and then you disperse it. So I think it's a fairly decent combination. It kind of captures everything. And we have a component here that does that. What can it do? It can act as an arbiter. I'd like to see this transformed into a formal organization that can do these things. It acts as an arbiter of knowledge. It can kind of be an agent for the change to help the the establish the standards, like the Knowledge Quality Specifications Organization. You can have, we, i.e., it could be a, act as a previewer for the writers and reviewers. We have a system here that's, uh, we, we developed, it, it, it's, it, I, for Elias has developed it. I'm not speaking for IS, but I see, I've seen it, where you have a pre-review of the material to be presented at the conference. Then you have a post-conference review. So you have the input before the conference and after. I see that as a very valuable approach. That might be part of a solution for a lot of these journals and conferences. You have kind of a general review. How does it sit out there? What kinds of comments? Just have it an open field. So when the reviewers look at all these comments, they can say what others, things that they may or not, not have caught. Might have been something very obvious. Let's say the reviewer is his own worst reviewer, or her own reviewer. So it's, again, you need that confluence of difference. I think it could be a forum for writers and editors to discuss peer review problems. I think we need some organization, agency, movement, something to start looking at this whole idea of peer review. If you're going to have that, if we're going to think we have that as a component of academia or anything else and all these other areas I talk with. So I think we can link together the editors and all these other people in that process. If you're involved in that peer review process, given the first slide or two, that's where you, I think this could be very valuable. Last slide, what can you do? Talked about this, talked probably too long. 
I think is to get inside yourself, first of all. What are your values? You've got to know thyself. What are your values? And then you start from there. I say, I really want truth. I want to search for something that's going to be fundamental. I talk about relative absolutes. We, okay, it seems to be the case for now, but at least I'm honest with myself saying, I'm trying. That's what I think it may be. If something changes, like Einsteinian mechanics replacing Newtonian, okay, you change. Or you, you can use Kuhn's paradigm shifts, whatever you want to use. But you, you have to acknowledge, yeah, there's going to be change. But you establish something for, what, for this while. But you're honest with yourself. Know thyself. And move on from that. But clearly, from what I think I, I presented so far, I mean, there's evidence enough to support my argumentation for that we need to really look at the peer review process and try to do something about it. I'm just wondering about the whole integrity of all of academia. So I'm just going to leave that with you. Just know thyself. So 